Welcome to part two, a topic that one cannot do justice to in a short while. In the first part, we had Ashika, Legal Eagle, discussing South African law and women's rights. We went on to Linda, also a Legal Eagle, because that's what we have today, just Legal Eagles. <laughs> and she brought in customary law. Now, what was very fascinating was the succession title in the one that Linda discussed. But that's all going to be tied together towards the end of this session. The third part is going to be based on Sharia law. Now, a lot of people don't understand that people of Islamic faith, are bound by a law that is in keeping with their religious uh, doctrine and what's expected of them. Now remember, the religion started in a different era, in a different society. And that is honored no matter where they go in the world. They have to stick to Sharia principles be it money, be it property, be it marriage, be it inheritance, be it succession. I don't want to say much. I'd love to introduce our third legal legal for the afternoon, Raisa Issa. Raisa completed her bachelor's in law at the Free State University. And she presently serves as the secretary of Nadell. And that's the National Association of Democratic Lawyers. Besides that, Raisa comes from a background of social justice. I think this young lady grew up seeing social justice in practice and seeing business in practice as well. I was delighted to make her acquaintance once again after many, many years and to know that she had gone into the legal field. Raisa has the persona of this modern 21st century girl. But she's also very deeply rooted in her culture and very mindful of that as well. Raisa, I'm not going to say much more. I know that you do a lot of voluntary work for NGOs and all that kind of thing. But talk us through Sharia law with the aspects that I've described. Thank you, Shanta, for such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, you make me seem so much nicer than I actually am. <laughs> I wish my mom was here to hear that. <laughs> um, so everyone, my name is Raisa and I am an attorney in Peter Maritzburg. Um, I am the youngest in this group and I'm very, very, very delighted that you guys have chosen me to um, assist in especially with this topic um, it's it's something that I'm very passionate about and I feel women need to be empowered to the max um, Sharia law and I think I think let's just start off by just chatting a little bit about Sharia law and what it is um, as Shanta mentioned earlier it is the laws that govern the Islamic religion and um, just a little background um, we have an Islamic calendar as well. And the year that we're currently sitting in is uh, 1441. So it is 1,441 years since the inception of the religion, Islam. Um, Sharia law is the sort of guideline or the governing authority, which is derived from scriptural sources, which we have um, which is the Quran and various hadiths. Now, hadiths are sort of the teachings and the sort of guidelines that many jurists witness the Prophet of Islam, which is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, they had witnessed him, and they have um, written it down, and that was how it was passed down generation to generation. Um, however, in terms of Sharia law, I have to say that women play an essential role in the Muslim community. 
Um, I personally believe that Sharia laws have adopted the theories of integration and justice rather than the theories of competition and equality, which we see here in everyday lives, um, especially in the 21st century and especially in such a modern society. Um, ultimately, Sharia laws and rules distribute human rights between men and women, depending on their nature, but not just depending on their personal need. Um, there, are, there are many stereotypes and misconceptions concerning women's rights in terms of Sharia law. Um, these have arisen due to a lack of understanding of the objectives of Sharia law. Um, one of the main topics, and especially one that we have touched on um, in this video conference was the issue of divorce and women's rights pertaining to um, divorce. And divorce in Islam, if we have to look at it, divorce is something, we look at the, the religion as a very male dominated, a very patriarchal religion that only affords rights to males. And this is one of the major misconceptions that we have because females themselves actually have rights afforded to them. And it's Islam protects females. Sharia laws were brought about to protect females. And this is why I say that it's the distribution of human rights depending on your nature and not your personal need. Um, just because I'm a female does not necessarily mean that there's things that I can't do. Um, so in Islam, we have, like we're talking about divorce and the way that it usually takes, there are various ways that divorces take place. The way specifically that a lot of people know of is the divorce initiated by the male, which is the use of the lock. Um, the lock is an Urdu word, it's derived from um, Urdu scriptures. So it's not an Arabic term. Um, the meaning of the lock is repu repudiation, basically going back to um, a position as if it never happened. Um, and simply you need three talaqs in order for you to be divorced, which you know, if you have to sit back and think about it in the 21st century perspective, you think that's crazy. I mean, just one word three times and, you know, it's, it's seriously just crazy. Um, however, this is something which is not locally practiced um, as much as they do overseas. There's a concept called cool or hula, which is a mutual divorce and it's also a divorce initiated by females um, and females are awarded the right to initiate the divorce um, and that is one of the main rights afforded to a female um, especially in Sharia law. I'd like to chat a little further about hula um, because Sharia law has afforded this right to the woman. Um, it is a procedure whereby a woman can divorce her husband by returning the meher. Now, the meher is um, an Arabic term, and it refers to um, dawa is the correct English term, but it's the dowry given um, by the man to the woman upon marriage. Um, it could also be anything given by the husband to the female upon agreement. Um, the hula could also take place by agreement between the parties or by a court's decree. So usually this takes place, the woman would need the assistance of either a higher authoritative power, which would either be um, someone from the Jamaatul Ulama, which is our um, authoritative figure here in South Africa, or a court if need be. South Africa, South African laws, South African, uh, the South African legal system does recognize um, talaq and Muslim marriages and divorces. Um, further to divorce proceedings, 
the issue of maintenance and custody arises. And this is the fun part because um, once you get divorced as a female in Islam, you have to sit through a, mor a so-called mourning period, not because you have to be sad that you're losing a husband, um, but it's to protect the honor of the female. Um, and during this mourning period, which usually lasts approximately, approximately three menstrual cycles, um, the male has to support and maintain the wife during this time. So he has to make sure that she is fed, she has a roof over her head, she has all her basic needs. Um, and, and, and I say basic because some ladies, you know, you don't necessarily need a Louis Vuitton handbag to be alive and, and mourn your divorce. Um, <laughs> some people do necessarily take it overboard. So he needs to make sure that you are supported during this time. Um, Raisa, can, can I just, uh, just uh, interrupt you here? I know of a case where the man even sought the ladies contraceptives. Yes. That was, part, that was part of, you know, he sought to it while he was with her. So he was morally obligated. And when I was doing this um, counseling with the, you know, the specific issue, I had, I looked around and I saw raised eyebrows. You know, like, what is he giving you the contraception for? And then, um, the lady involved was very bashful about it. So, you know, I had to be the one to, to speak about it. And fortunately, I had great support from the community and from the leaders of the community that I engaged in for advice before I went into, um, you know, the, this issue. So yeah, just, you know, right down to the contraceptives, he has to look after you. He's morally bound to, yes. as if you are still yes. married to him. Okay, I just wanted um, to bring that part in. I think, and, and, and thank you, thank you very much for bringing that up, because on that, I, I think, you know, I'm, a lot of, as you said earlier, a lot of people don't specifically know about Sharia law. So let me just go back a bit and explain the Iddath period, which is the mourning period. Um, during this period, the female is actually not allowed or is, should not leave the house. Um, she should not be seen in the street. She should not be seen associate, associating herself or socializing herself with anyone during this time. And that is one of the reasons why the male is supposed to, and, and I say supposed to because it is his duty, it's an obligation put onto him to maintain the wife, as if Shanta said, they were still married. Um, the next issue that I was going to chat about was children. Um, and especially in this day and age where divorces are so rife, um, this was actually one of the hardest topics to find research on um, because a lot of people confuse tradition, culture, and religion all together mm. in one. Um, tradition, culture, and especially if you live in such an advanced society, a modern society like South Africa, where in terms of the court, females, um, the court will decide who gets custody and who gets um, the children. Whereas in terms of Islamic law, any minor children automatically gets given, and I want to say, say given, but the mothers afforded um, custody over the children, especially at their minor age. Um, it is actually quite a big thing in Islam because Islam believes that a child needs their mother to grow. Um, once they reach the age of puberty, um, the Islamic term that we use or the Arabic term that we use is balif, um, the children need to move from their mom to their dad. Um, which can either happen by agreement, but specifically for male children. Male children cannot live with their mom, unfortunately. They would have to go to their dad. Um, so during that period, that, that's how the sort of custody arrangement works between um, the husband and the wife. Um, go ahead. 
sorry, I've lost my track um, where I was actually chatting about. I'm just going to put that away for now. I'm going to chat off the top of my head. Um, in terms of children, the male is during, and especially during the Idlib period, um, the male has to compensate the female for the children as well. Um, because the female, unfortunately, during that period cannot leave the house um, in order to provide um, daily necessity items such as food or to take the children to school. Now, let's just go back a bit and say, but what happens if the wife or the, the, the individual now single female um, is in a position where she cannot afford or she has no parents to assist her or actually no one to assist her with um, the children in terms of taking them to school, taking them to madrasa, which is the, our Islamic studies classes. Um, that is something that the husband needs to assist with and also contribute towards because the wife is being put in such a position that she's not allowed to leave um, the house. So I've actually had quite a lot to say about that, but I said in terms of time constraints, it's, you know, I can go on for days and days, but I really just want to make sure that we have enough time here. Um, I do hope that there is another session leading up to this where we can chat a little bit further about it. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to start mentioning that and especially, um, the hula, which is not something that is locally practiced. It's not a common local practice. Raisa, thank you very much. I have some questions that I'd like to ask you. We've yes. gone on to divorce. We've mm -hmm. gone on to custody. Could you please enlighten us a bit on inheritance according to the Islamic way, the way that the estate is divided? And also, um, uh, you know, what the wife comes into the marriage with. The purpose that she comes into a marriage with that money or with that security. Could you please just cover that for us as well? Okay, so I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to chat about um, the latter part because I'm not as knowledgeable and I have not researched that as much. Um, but in terms of the inheritance aspect, um, in terms of Sharia law, any sort of money is left behind or any, anything left behind has to be divided amongst um, the children. And, and males do get a higher preference because uh, the whole purpose of uh, well, a, ma a male's purpose in Islam is to sort of protect and uh, provide for the female. Um, once again, leading back to um, the very, you know, I want to use the word powerful position of a female in the ranks of Islam. Um, and in this way, it is divided into a two thirds and one third share. So if every male child it would have to be calculated would get, to, so let's just say we have um, one girl and one boy, the boy would get two thirds of the entire um, calculated um, assets minus liabilities, whatever is left over, uh, whereas the female will only get one third. Um, in terms of the amount given to the wife, I'm not too sure about that just yet. I would have to go into more research. So I'm, I refrain from answering that um, just yet because I don't want to give you any information that is incorrect. Okay. Based on that, Ashika? your comment with regard to that specific question proportion of estates um how does south african law govern that and then linda i'm going to come to you with customary law okay ashika talk right, about Chandra, south africa. so <laughs> there we go um in respect of south african law when it comes to succession and inheritance there are two distinct possibilities. The first being testate succession, where the person um, draws up a, a last will and testament and stipulates how their estate should devolve upon their passing. In that instance, as I said, um, the, the, uh, of significance is the question of uh, spouses 
who may be married in community and out of community of property. So if spouses are married in community of property, then when it comes to their will, they only have testamentary capacity. They can only make provision for their half share, um, which affords a wife, of course, some protection because the husband cannot, in, in um, a scenario where there's obviously uh, some acrimony, leave the entire estate, to which she has contributed during the subsistence of that marriage to a child, a relative, a girlfriend, all realities which uh, women face from um, on, a, on a daily basis. Then moving to the question of interstate succession, the rules um, which apply when the person who has passed on has not left a will. Our rules are as follows. So in the question of uh, a spouse, let's use an example, and the husband uh, has passed away without leaving a will. In those circumstances, our law provides for the surviving spouse to inherit, and in circumstances where the estate is large enough, then the surviving spouse and the children inherit in uh, equal shares. So the surviving spouse is entitled uh, to share as well as the children. In, in respect of estates that aren't large enough, then obviously the surviving spouse would inherit the entire estate. In circumstances where there is no surviving spouse, then the estate devolves on the children in equal shares, irrespective of whether they are male or female. And in circumstances, obviously, where there is no surviving spouse and no children, then the parents of the deceased person inherits, well, inherit in equal shares again. Um, and if there's only one surviving parent, that parent inherits the entire state. Okay, thank Ashika, you. I think when you speak of, Ashika, when you speak of large, how do we quantify that? How is that quantified? How is it defined? So we're talking about, and uh, the uh, precise amount escapes me, so I'll do what Raisa does and, and not quote the amount without having it in front of me. You, you can tell we are lawyers, we, we are very <laughs> careful about that. Yes. But, but there, is, there, is a, there is an amount stipulated. So, okay. it, it, there is, and it's referred to as, as that, and, uh, alternatively a child's share, whichever is um, the, the, the greater amount that the okay. spouse would be entitled to. Okay. I think that's perfect for now, just so that we understand that there's monetary amount linked to how we actually define uh, yes. large. Yes, in, in this. Yeah. Um, indeed. To the best of my knowledge, is that amount uh, something that's set down by the master's court when they um, are winding up the it estate? Is leg it's, it's, yeah. it's legislated. It's legislated. Yeah. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ashika. Now, Linda, let's look at this from the customary law point. Um, from the customary law, it's... Um, when the husband is, is deceased, um, her wife, his wife will get full share, 50%, and the other 50% of it divided among his children. Uh, that includes um, even children that are born out of wedlock. So children that love, love child, all those children, includes all those children, and they all get equal shares. If the if the husband is um, it was if if the man was not married, then his parents will get it, then his parents will take it. If he's um, uh, if he is not married and he does not have children, then his parents will take it. If he's married, um, but his wife is already dead and only children are left, then only the children will get it they will get inherit from the estate. Um, 
yeah, I think that's basically it's in the customary law. Ladies, <laughs> this has been fascinating, to say the least. Absolutely fascinating. I heard a comment uh, emanating. Was it you, Amika? Lin Linda, yes, please. Linda, I just want to ask again, I think, you know, just tying it all up to what uh, Raisa was sharing with us about Sharia law. Are there different amounts allocated based on gender? So do the males get a greater portion than the females from a customary perspective, or is it an equal proportion distributed across the number of children, regardless of gender? I'm sorry to have left that out. Um, um, uh, the male, the male child gets the highest portion, and then, um, uh, and then females, then the children, they just get the smaller portions. And sometimes it goes to the extent that um, when a female is already married, then they do not even include her in the inheritance. She's not even included. So if you like, in my case. Um, I'm already married, my sisters are already married, only one sister is left, and my brother. So all of us that are married won't even be given the, <laughs> the share. It's, it's, uh, in some situations when the estate isn't that much, then it's all given to the boy child. Wow. Bunny? As the person who started all this, the brainchild behind all this, your final words, your wrap up for this absolutely enlightening afternoon. Hey, Shanta, I don't think so. it's only my brainchild. I think it's a collective wisdom. It's we all learn from each other. You know, ladies, life is so complicated. And we have different cultural rules. It is still unknown to so many gaps that I've been talking about. This is the gaps that we need to fill to instill the confidence. Society really needs you legal eagles as human rights champions because society still has too many gaps. Thank you, Shanta and Omika, for opening Pandora's legal box. Lots of learning to do. And I'm very sure if we as like-minded ladies, we will be able to get together and the learnings from today, and we will be able to apply further learnings so that a few can benefit, if not a lot more. Thank you very much. Omika, your last bit before I close the session. You know, there's, there's a quote that comes to mind at this moment in time, and it's, I'm not free while any woman is unfree, even if her shackles are very different from my own. And I think it ties perfectly with what Bunny is saying, that hopefully these sessions educate and empower women. There's so much that we're so blissfully unaware of. And the only time that we actually are able to make more informed decisions and better choices is when we are empowered and educated. So thank you to all of you for the collective wisdom. And hopefully when this information is shared, we're going to make a difference to a few lives out there. Thank you. And to conclude, I hope that whoever watches this, looks at it and understands that we have no right to judge another woman for her position in society, her position in the marriage, whether she's the second wife or the third wife, her position in the family, whether she's a daughter, a mother, a sister. And when she gets divorced, to understand that she is still a complete woman. Amen. If she doesn't marry and she remains single for the rest of her life, she is still a respected human being. And if we can Build that kind of sisterhood. Can you imagine what we will do? I think we will take over the world. And I think that's what we should do. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so much. Bunny, thank you for allowing us to do these under the VUCA banner. It's such a pleasure for Mika and I. Raisa, Ashika, Linda, what a wonderful afternoon.
I'd really like to have you ladies on a panel again. Much love to all of you. And let's just carry on being strong, dynamic women and lift our sisters up. Look after the downtrodden and lift them up first. Thank you so much, ladies. Much appreciated. Thank you. 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 <laughs>